and welcome to my channel. So I thought I'd better do a video about my whole treatment plan uh, from start to finish. I am now at the end of my treatment uh, for triple negative breast cancer. Um, there's been lots of ups and downs. So I thought I'd better just kind of share my story about what's kind of happened over that whole seven months of cancer treatment. So my story starts before I had cancer. Um, so my family history is that my grandmother had breast cancer back in the 60s. She was 34 when she was diagnosed. She was 42 when she sadly passed away. Um, my mom, so that was my maternal grandmother. My mom had breast cancer when she was 57. So she had triple negative breast cancer. Um, and that was four and a half years ago. And touch wood, she is still uh, four years clear now, so that's fantastic. Prior to my breast cancer, I was actually the fittest that I'd ever been. I was going to the gym five times a week. I was uh, working full time. I'm a learning technologies consultant, so I go into schools. And I train teachers on how to use um, iPads and computers and technology and stuff. <laughs> um, so I was doing that full time. I was also uh, studying for a master's degree, so doing that in my spare time. I'm a single mom, um, so I was very busy and I was very tired, which I kind of put down to being very busy. Um, I'm the type of person to kind of do everything at full speed. I don't like sitting down. I don't like doing nothing. I'm always out, I'm always up, walking, running, cycling, gym, very busy. So I've been tired for probably a good three or four months, um, but not really thought very much about it. I just thought I was run down. Um, and again, didn't think much about it. Uh, it was the beginning of August. Now I've always been very, very um, conscious very conscious about checking myself because of my family history very very conscious about making sure that I checked now I always checked in the shower always 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 every time I had a shower I just cop a feel just because I was hyper aware of my mum having it we were turned down for genetic testing um, but in my head there's always this kind of mm, your nan died when she was really young your mum had it when she was quite young so I've always been really vigilant about checking so I kind of, I was lying down, um, put my hand inside my bra and was just kind of messing around and I felt this lump. It was very small and it was quite deep down. So I felt it and I kind of thought, oh, that's, mm, that's not right. So I got my boyfriend to have a feel and he couldn't feel it. Um, and then after he kind of took his hand off, I couldn't find it again. Um, I was quite worried and I kind of told my boyfriend and I just said you know like my mom's had it my nan died of it blah 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 and he was the one that said right well you need to get to the doctors don't you and you need to go and get it checked so I was like right okay so this was like I think this was like a Monday night um so the next day I, th I woke up and I thought right well I need to I need to book a doctor's appointment so that was fine um and I was off to work um so as I was getting ready as you do naked <laughs> in front of my bedroom mirror, putting on deodorant, um, just absentmindedly, putting on deodorant, and I looked, and underneath my boob, as I pulled my arm up, um, there was a dent. So it looked like someone had stuck their thumb in the bottom of my boob, and it was a proper dent, and it was really obvious. It was small, about this big, it was tiny, but it was really obvious. Um, and I think at that point I kind of knew that this was not going to end well but as you do you kind of think mm, okay well it could be it could be anything it could be anything um, but that was the that was the point where I thought mm, yeah this is really not right so I phoned my doctor explained um, and they were absolutely fab so the receptionist got me in the day after so she couldn't get me in that day but she got me in the day after um, and I went and I saw my doctor. 
he was fantastic. I explained again my family history. I said, look, my mum's had it, my nan's had it. Um, my mum had triple negative. So he examined me and he couldn't, he couldn't feel the lump and he couldn't see the dent. But despite that, despite not being able to see it himself, he referred me for an emergency mammogram. And I will forever be grateful for that because I know a lot of girls that have fallen foul of this kind of, oh, I couldn't get past my GP, they didn't see it, they didn't stand. Um, so I will forever be grateful for him. So he referred me for a mammogram. So that was the Wednesday. So 10 days later, I got my mammogram appointment. Um, so I went with my mum, quite, it was quite traumatic, to be honest. So we arrived at half eight, I was in with my um, breast surgeon, so I met him, um, bang on half past eight. He could see the dent, so this kind of then worried me a little bit because I thought, well, kind of thought with a GP he couldn't see it, maybe I was just imagining it. But my breast surgeon was like, yeah, I can see that. It's like, oh. Okay, um, so he said, right, we've got a, a three-step system. So you will go for an ultrasound, you'll go for a mammogram, um, and if these two pick up anything, you'll then have to go for a biopsy, and all these will be done today. So he said, hopefully it'll be two-step system, it might be three. Okay. So then they take you to the next bit, so I sort of took my mum with me to the next waiting room, <laughs> um, and I went in with a lady who I came to know quite well because she's done all my ultrasounds <laughs> so I met her for the first time um, and she did my ultrasound and she said yep I can see something at the back that I need to biopsy Fuck. okay so that's when alarm bells really started ringing um, so they took me in and I had my mammogram um, while all the while thinking, oh god, I've got to go back for a, a biopsy after this. Um, and the mammogram came back clear, so the lady said, yeah, I've had a quick look, we'll need to get the doctor to have a proper look, but it's looking pretty clear, I can't see anything. So it's kind of, oh, okay, well, ultrasound picks something up, but mammogram hasn't, what's kind of what's going on. So I then went back in uh, and sat with my mum for a little bit, so she got kind of pulled into a smaller office. Um, my mum's had all this, my mum's had a fine uh, core needle biopsy, she's had the mammogram, she's had the ultrasound, so I think alarm bells started to ring for her as well because she looked quite worried. So um, they then took me off again, I went back in with the ultrasound lady and she did a core needle biopsy. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, it's not the nicest thing I've ever had. Um, so they have a, a big needle basically and it's hollow. And what they do is um, they insert the needle. So they give you a local anaesthetic. So she localised it um, and inserted the needle. So you can't really feel it at that point. So that's fine. But you can feel it's kind of like a tugging. Um, so she had to get it right next to the tumour. So she was ultrasounding on one side. So pushing down and then putting the needle in. Because she has to find where the tumour is. Because um, it's ultrasound lead. And it then shoots out a little needle that takes a portion of this biopsy so the first three times she did that it was fine it was a, it makes a really big clicking noise which is a bit disconcerting but it doesn't hurt the last two oh my God, they did hurt um and i, I think it was because she either she hadn't anesthetized properly or it was into the middle of the whatever it was it had changed slightly so the fourth one made me cry and I don't cry ever. I haven't cried in any of the rest of my cancer treatment but that made me blot my eyes out. Um, and then she said I have to do one more so you're just gonna have to grit your teeth and just, she said it's either this or you come back and you have another biopsy. So I gritted my teeth, cried a lot um, and that was that. So I kind of came out of that appointment feeling like really emotionally battered, awful. Um, so we then get taken from my ultrasound, we get taken back and said, right, well, you need to go and talk to the doctor. He categorically said, the chances of this being something are very, very slim. He said, it doesn't look like cancer. 
um, from the mammogram, it not showing up, he said, I would be very surprised if it comes back and it's cancer. So he said, go away, don't worry about it. So he promised me the results three days later. So the three days went past and I was supposed to get a phone call giving me my results. So I get the phone call at work from a lady, fully expecting the results, and she said, yeah, we haven't been able to look at the results yet. Uh, we have to get uh, the doctor to look at them first. So you're going to have to wait till next week. So that that was possibly the worst point of my whole cancer treatment was that bit being told you've waited three days. They've been the worst three days of your life, but now you have to wait seven more. That was not good. Um, and looking back, I should have known because actually what had happened was it my results had shown that it was cancer and they have what's called, um, I think it's an MDM meeting. It's basically a multidisciplinary meeting where your oncologist meets your breast care surgeon and your somebody else. So oncology, breast surgeon and somebody else um, meet. The three of them have to meet and agree on your treatment plan. So that was what had happened. They'd identified that I had cancer, but they couldn't meet with me without saying, well, this is gonna be your treatment plan. So I had an appointment for the following Wednesday. So I had to go in. So we had a half eight appointment. I went and met, I took my mom and dad, luckily. Um, it was just gonna be me and mom, but I think my dad kind of felt that he needed to come, which was good really. So we got taken into a room and um, my mum jokingly said as we walked in, well, they wouldn't give you bad news in this room. It's horrific because it was <laughs> it was the size of a broom cupboard. It was tiny. It was just a proper examination room. We didn't really think much about it. Um, and we were kind of laughing and joking and we planned to go somewhere nice for breakfast and it was all, you know, this is just going to be a bump in the road. It's fine. So my breast surgeon comes in. Um, and brings with him an, uh, another person. So um, introduces the breast care nurse, and I can remember thinking, well, why do I need a breast care nurse? That's really strange. Um, and clocked my mum's face, and my mum's face dropped because well, breast care nurses are only involved in breast care when there's breast surgery because of cancer. So I hadn't clocked this. Mum had. Um, so my doctor introduced the service, this is so and so for the breast care nurses, um, and then proceeds to sit there and kind of, he said, um, right, well, you had a mammogram last week, an ultrasound, and I can remember thinking, yeah, yeah, I know what I've had, you don't need to recap it, um, and he took ages, and then the words, uh, unfortunately, there were cancer cells found in your biopsy, was kind of said, and I can remember thinking, okay, uh, like it was not there wasn't that you have cancer it was it was kind of a bit of a, a generic oh, there are cancers so it took a while for it to sink in and then it is true what they say it just kind of goes boom, like nothing else goes in once they've said that you've got cancer nothing else goes in at all so it all went a bit quiet and I can remember they were saying stuff to me um, I can remember sitting on the bed and just kind of being a bit like, oh my God. Um, and it didn't really sink in. So I can kind of remember saying, does this mean I need like chemo? Do I, is it like surgical? Is it just radiation? And he was like, yeah, you're going to need chemotherapy. You're going to need surgery and you're going to need radiation. So I was just like, oh my God. So it just, it takes a while for it to sink in. Um, so at that point he kind of said, right. I'm going to leave you to it um, and we'll come back in a minute, we've got to sign your consent forms, blah blah blah. So he left me and my mum and dad um, and that's kind of the first and only time that I think I've ever seen my dad cry, which was heartbreaking in itself um, because my dad's just a big bear um, who's all about family so that really, that kind of broke my heart and then seeing my mum and knowing how much my mum's been through, obviously my mum's, my mum's whole life has sort of been punctuated by cancer her mum had it she had it and now she's got to watch her daughter go through it so that was heartbreaking as well um and then obviously the implications i've got a little boy he's uh, 10 like this is just uh, this is just like a nightmare and surely i'm gonna wake up and blah 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 
so that was my diagnosis. So that was August 23rd, 2017. I thought it was burnt in my memory or anything. Um, so then it all just went a bit crazy. Um, I had to have um, another ultrasound scan. I had to have a clip inserted into my tumour. I had to go and have, meet my oncologist. Um, so the next four weeks were kind of crazy and my sister had just announced that she was pregnant two days beforehand so it was just the worst timing my poor family so it all got a bit crazy um so four weeks later i started my chemo so my oncologist i met my oncologist within that four weeks i went and i did a tour of the chemo ward i met my lovely chemo nurses who were amazing So my treatment plan was, um, I was going to do, or I did do, <laughs> FEC T. Um, so I did three treatments of FEC, three weeks apart, and then three treatments of doxytaxel, three weeks apart. Um, the chemotherapy itself wasn't as bad as I was expecting it to be. I was quite lucky in the, in the uh, side effects department. The FEC I definitely found easier than the T. Um, so the FEC side effects were things like um, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, diarrhoea, uh, mouth ulcers. I didn't really get much of it. I got quite a bit of nausea. I felt really sicky. Did not have any problems eating. I know a lot of people do. Sadly, I did not. <laughs> um, and managed to put on a stone and a half, which I'm now trying to lose. Um, but that weight gain came on quite quickly because of the steroids that I had to take for the first few weeks. Um, so I fared quite well on FEC. Um, doxytaxel, a whole different ball game, unfortunately. I had, so doxytaxel side effects are mostly to do with um, nerve, bone pain, fatigue, um, sickness, diarrhea, but it's very much about pain as opposed to like sickness um and i i did have quite a bit of bone pain i wasn't as bad as some so i didn't need a, a, they did say oh you can have some morphine if the bone pain gets really bad so i didn't have that bad um but i was having to take a lot of ibuprofen and paracetamol and cocodamol and codeine um i was offered some nerve pain uh, drugs but i decided not to take those um so the nerve pain is kind of disorientating feels like it's kind of hard to describe actually it feels like um like zinging pains in your joints it, it's the oddest feeling i think i've ever had um and you just generally you ache all over and it, it's really it really it hurts it, it just it hurts um, but the hardest thing with the doxytaxel was I was neutropenic for the whole of it. So um, I have I had weekly blood tests throughout the whole of my chemo. Um, so you have something called your neutrophils, um, which kind of uh, they fight infections in your body. It's part of your white blood count. So they checked my lymphocytes and my neutrophils, um, and I was responding so well to chemo that it killed all of my neutrophils. So I had. I literally had a zero neutrophil count for the whole of my doxytaxel chemo and what that meant was I couldn't fight any infection so I managed to kind of catch most things going so um, I caught eye infections I had a chest infection um, it just generally felt really run down and crappy Found out in December, so between cycle four and five, found out that I had tested positive for BRCA1. So that meant that my cancer was genetic, which we suspected all along because of the family history. Um, but the implications of that were quite far reaching, really. Um, if I hadn't been BRCA1, my cancer was small enough to just have a lumpectomy, so I could have just had it taken out. Um, and it was right by the chest wall, so it probably wouldn't have been like a disfiguring surgery, um, which we were all hoping for. <laughs> but sadly, it was not to be. Um, 
So I tested positive for BRCA1 and that means that I had an 85% lifetime risk of getting breast cancer and I had a really high risk of getting breast cancer again if I just had a lumpectomy. So they gave me the option to have a double mastectomy. Um, I didn't have to do it, I could have been scanned regularly but I did question it with my surgeon and he just kind of said look you know you can do what you want but he thought if I had breast cancer diagnosed at the age of 34 that it was likely that I would get it again like highly likely like pretty much sign up to chemo again likely <laughs> um, and I didn't really want to risk that with uh, having a little one and only being 34 and not wanting to have to fight it again, not wanting to lose my hair again, not wanting to go through it. So I signed up for a double mastectomy. So my double mastectomy was scheduled for mid-Feb, which would have been four weeks after the end of my chemo. I finished chemo on the 17th of January 2018. Um, and then five days after my last chemo, I caught the flu. <laughs> So I was fine on the Sunday and then overnight on the Mon like the Sunday night my temperature went up to 38.6 um, so my hospital has a plan in place I had to phone people if my temperature went over 37 so part of your chemo is that you have to take your temperature like three times a day I was taking my temperature and generally it was quite low I would always function around 36 um, and I never really went over 37.4. Um, if my temperature got to 37.5, it was immediate. You have to go to hospital, you have to be checked out, you have to have blood tests. Um, so I went to bed on a Sunday um, with a normal temperature, feeling fine. Woke up about mm, half four or five, feeling a bit, oh, I don't feel good. Got a bit of a sore throat, just felt a bit headachey and a bit like, can't explain it, just a bit not great so I went downstairs about half five took my temperature 38.6 thought oh my god okay because what that can be a sign of is that there's an infection going on in your body um, and you may not show signs and because you have no white blood cells you have nothing to fight the infection so you can get very very poorly very very quick with chemo like within two hours you can be um, facing sepsis which is potentially fatal so it was quite a not a good thing we had to phone the hospital um, and they said look you need to come in straight away so we went to A&E uh, and they have they should have most hospitals should have a plan in place for people that are immunocompromised which is what you're classified as when you're going through chemo so I was lucky I got taken straight in to assessment. Assessment took me straight into, I don't know, triage is it? I don't know. They hooked me up straight to a drip. They didn't know what was wrong at that point. They just knew that I had an infection. So they did blood cultures to try and find out where the infection was. And they actually didn't test me for flu at that point, which is a bit strange. Um, so then I got admitted and I got taken up to a ward. Got taken up, my blood pressure was dropping which it always does I have really low blood pressure and it drops every time I'm even remotely poorly it goes down to like 70 over 50 which is just well it drops off the bottom of the chart um so I then got diagnosed with flu really poorly that night my blood pressure was dropping to something stupid like 63 over 33 um they were calling um on call doctors they were trying to push um saline into my into my veins like really fast i had like a, i had like i think it was a liter of saline pushed into me in like 15 minutes like it, it, you could hear the machine was going crazy it was it was the it was pretty traumatic to be honest i'm not gonna lie it was horrific um to the point where i came out of hospital after flu and i just cried for days it was horrible <laughs> So I was in hospital for six days with flu. Um, I couldn't get a handle on my temperature. It was going up to 39, 39.2. I was really, really poorly. Um, and I felt horrific. And that actually, that knocked me around for two weeks. 
So the knock-on effect of catching flu with chemo and being uh, immunocompromised was that my um, surgery then got put off for a month. So I didn't have surgery until eight weeks after my chemo finished, which was a long time. So I went back to work, which was brilliant. Um, only for a couple of days a week uh, and that really made me feel like a normal person again it was amazing it was so nice to see everyone and use my brain even though it's severely compromised by chemo brain <laughs> So I had my double mastectomy in March, March 13th, 2018. So I had a skin sparing, nipple sparing, double mastectomy, direct to implant reconstruction, immediate reconstruction. Um, so basically what they did was they took all the breast tissue out and just shoved an implant in and then stitched me up. <laughs> Um, they also took part of my chest wall, so they had to stitch that up because my cancer was invading the chest wall, which is why it was classified as a stage 3B, even though other indicators meant that I was more likely more like a stage 2. Um, they took five lymph nodes from under my right armpit. Um, so the mastectomy itself, the mastectomy, I had a pretty horrible first night. Again, my blood pressure drops. It just drops like through the floor. Always scares the nurses, even though I tell them my blood pressure is really low. It's always low. <laughs> so they phoned um, uncle doctors. So I had to see the doctor. So I got wheeled in after my uh, surgery at sort of seven o'clock at night, put back on the ward. A very groggy, had a bad reaction to the morphine, bad reaction to the anesthesia. I was really, really sick. Um, had a bit of a temperature, so I was about 38, which they don't like after surgery because obviously it could be a sign of infection. My blood pressure dropped through the floor. Again, it went below 70 over 40. Um, it was, yeah, pretty bleh, crap first night. So the doctor out twice, not just once, but twice. That's when you know you're really poorly in a hospital. When you see a doctor at night, that's generally you're really poorly. If you see him twice, I thought I was dying. <laughs> um, they took blood cultures at 4am um, with a rather annoying blood culture phlebotomist who opened my curtain and went, oh my God, <laughs> when she saw me. I must have looked like death. I was white. I had no hair at that point. No eyebrows because they're painting on. No makeup. I must have looked horrific, to be fair. I must have looked pretty grotty. Um, so I was in hospital for three days after my mastectomy, my double, double mastectomy, um, and was moving around pretty well. Um, so that was three and a half weeks ago. Feeling good. Uh, I've still got a bit of fatigue, so I need an afternoon nap nowadays. But feeling generally pretty good. Uh, moving around really well. I've still got one surgical drain in, but I've, I had four afterwards. Uh, which was just a pain. So the first week was pretty grotty. Uh, I just, I couldn't really walk. I couldn't do anything for myself. Um, showering was pretty crap. Um, but I could do more than I thought I could. Um, so I could touch the top of my head. Straight after surgery, I could touch the top of my head. So that was fine. Results wise, I'm not overly happy. My surgeon's not overly happy. Um, the problem is, I'm skinny, apparently. <laughs> Despite putting on, well, I was 10 stone before before chemo, um, and I'm now 11 stone five. So, despite putting on, what's that, like a stone and a half, they're still classifying me as too skinny. Um, and the problem is, I'm quite, I'm a, I'm a pear shape, so I carry all my weight on my thighs, and none of it on my top. So I've got like no, um, I've got no fat, basically, on my bust at all. So when they took all the tissue out, there was no fat left. So they put the implant in and you can kind of, you can see the implant under the skin, which is crap, really. So my surgeon has said that I will need another surgery. So I'm gonna need a revision surgery, which actually is kind of good because they're gonna, what they're gonna do, <laughs> I've had a free boob job on the NHS, and then what they're going to do is they're going to liposuction my thighs. Yes, they are. And then they're going to use that fat and they're going to layer it over the top of my chest to soften it up. 
So hopefully once my revision surgery is done, so that'll be scheduled for about another three months time. So once that's done, they'll look a lot better. But at the moment they just look like implants stuck on the front of my chest. Um, pain wise, very manageable. Um, not really in any pain. I've got a bit of nerve pain going on whilst they regenerate, but generally I'm feeling really good. Um, so the last bit of my treatment should be radiotherapy. Um, I'm actually going to refuse radiotherapy. Controversial. Um, my reasons for that are nobody seems to be able to give me a good enough reason to do it. There's very much... Um, this attitude that oh well you should do it just in case um, and my argument is that I was given my pathology results from my surgeon and he uh, said I had a complete pathological response to chemo which means that the uh, chemotherapy completely killed my cancer which is amazing best result that you can possibly ask for um, and there was no spread to my lymph nodes so I've had a double mastectomy uh, to remove, remove all my breast tissue because I'm BRCA1. I had a complete pathological response, so there was no cancer left and there was no spread to my lymph nodes. So those three things to me say that there's no cancer in my body. At least there's no cancer where the cancer was supposed to be. So I don't really see the point in doing the radiotherapy. Um, I've read quite a lot of research that says that it can cause cancer in later life. Um, and I'm only 34. I'm not. I'm. I'm not old at all by any stretch of the imagination. I might feel it on a Friday night when I'm out, but I'm not old. I've got plenty of years left. I don't want to do all this surgery that I'm having to do to stay cancer-free to then get cancer again because I did radiotherapy. So that's kind of my reason for not wanting to do it. Um, and my oncologist and my breast surgeon seem to be kind of saying well belt and braces you should do it just in case um my argument well there's nowhere for it to grow there's no breast tissue left and there shouldn't be any left where the surgical site was had clear margins and a complete pathological response radiation isn't going to stop me from getting a stage four spread so if there are rogue cancer cells around my body the radiation is not going to stop that um nothing can stop that just got to accept it. So as far as I'm concerned, I am now done with my treatment. I'm completely finished. Other than my revision surgeries um, for my reconstruction, I feel like I'm done. Um, and I'm quite happy with my treatment. The NHS have been fantastic. I can't fault them. Um, every medical person that I've met has been amazing, apart from the odd one or two. I'll name no names. Um, but I cannot fault my treatment and I must say a big thank you to the NHS for looking after me because you've been amazing. Um, going forwards, I'm going to need six monthly checkups with my oncologist. Um, unfortunately, I have triple negative breast cancer, which means that it's not hormone receptive, which means that ongoing treatment, I don't have the options that other hormone receptive cancers have. I don't have any targeted therapies I can take. Yeah, it's kind of crap. But it's nice because I'm not going to have to take any drugs from now on. I hate taking drugs. I hate the way it makes me feel. I like to be drug free. Even pain meds. I don't like taking pain meds. So I'm looking forward to just being free of that. I just, I have to watch for spread. So going forwards, I have to watch for spread to my liver, lungs, brain, bones. So I just have to watch for things like a cough. Um, being sick, headaches, dizziness, um, pain in my bones, all of those can be kind of indicators that it has spread and it's stage four. So sadly, you know, if it does come back, then it's going to be terminal. But indicators are that I am going to be one of the lucky ones um, that lives a nice cancer-free life. And I'm looking forward to it. I can't bloody wait. So I've got five years until I'm officially, that's it, breast cancer, never again. So I'm just going to live my life to the full, go on holiday a lot, probably drink a lot. <laughs> um, make the most of every day. Um, 
And then the only other thing that I have to do is I have to have my ovaries, my fallopian tubes out because I'm BRCA1. But that's something to consider at a later date. I don't have to think about that till I'm 40. So that's good. So that is my cancer journey. So I'm hoping, touch wood, that that is the end of it. And I won't have to do any of this again. My hair is growing back. My eyebrows are growing back. I'm starting to feel like a normal person again. And I'm so happy. So um, for any of you out there that are facing uh, the start of your cancer journey, it's doable. It's shit at the time but you will suddenly wake up and you'll be at the end of your cancer journey mine was seven months uh, from diagnosis to being told I had a complete pathological response and I was cancer free there will be lots of people that will tell you wow that seven months went quick yeah maybe for you <laughs> but you will get through it the chemo was doable the surgery is doable just be kind to yourself, just look after yourselves um, and there are plenty of success stories out there okay it's not the death sentence that it once was um, so best of luck with your treatment if you're going through treatment at the moment if you want to ask any questions add them in the comments below um, and if you have liked this video make sure you like and subscribe to my channel um, and I'll see you again for another video.